All right, it's uh, 10.30 p.m. in Melbourne, must be 1.30 p.m. in Europe. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have uh, one session scheduled today for the PQMI workshop. Uh, we have three brilliant papers scheduled uh, uh, and I will just move to the papers uh, for the sake of time uh, and have more time for questions and discussions. So the first paper is presented by Daniel Schuster. It's a paper called Alignment Approximation for Process Trees. Uh, three authors, Daniel Schuster, Sebastian Van Zelst, and Will Van der Rast. So Daniel, please share your slides. Yes, just give me a second. Do you see the presentation? Perfect, yes. So thank you very much for the introduction. And I would like to start this presentation with a short, brief motivation and the question why we should actually consider um, alignment approximation for process trees. So first of all, alignments became kind of the center technique within conformance checking to compute all kinds of statistics, for example, fitness or precision values. And usually when you calculate an alignment, you reduce it to a shortest path problem However, the state spaces that need to be explored, they grow usually non-linear with the size of the trace and also the complexity of the model. So especially if you have a lot of parallel behavior in your model, uh, the state spaces become quickly very large. And on the other hand, we have process trees, which are well-studied class of process models. So they represent block structures on workflow nets. And many state-of-the-art process discovery algorithms, they actually work on process trees or they return process trees. For example, all these inductive minor algorithms so this whole family. And on this slide, I would like to, to sketch out a bit the conceptual idea of our approach. So assume this given process tree that we have here. So that's the process tree that we have. And also assume the trace that needs to be aligned. So we have D, C, A, B, C, D, A, E. And now the idea is that we recursively split the trace along the tree hierarchy. So first of all, we have the sequence operator that tells us that we have to execute the left subtree before we have to execute the right subtree. And if we look closely, we can see that we can replay D, C, A, B, C, D in the left subtree and A, E in the right subtree. And therefore we split the trace at the highlighted position and generate two subtraces out of it. Now we have here D, C, A, B, C, D that needs to be aligned on this subtree. And the root operator is a loop. That means we have to execute first the left subtree and then we can either stop or we execute the right subtree and then afterwards we have to again execute the left subtree. And if we look closely, we can see that we can replay D, C, A, B and C, D in the left subtree. Hence, we split at these highlighted positions. That means we first assign DC to the left subtree, then we assign the empty trace to the right subtree, AB to the left, empty trace to the right, and CD to the left. Then we continue. So we have now three subtraces that needs to be aligned on this subtree. And the choice is very simple. That means we either execute the left subtree or the right subtree, Hence, we assign DC and CD to the right subtree and AB to the left subtree. And at this point, we stop this recursive splitting along the tree hierarchy. And for all these generated subtraces, we calculate actually optimal alignments. So we use the standard algorithm on these small subtrees and the subtraces. So we get sub alignments. And now in the third step, we go up again. So we recursively compose an alignment for the upper node. So in this case, we, for example, see an alignment for A, B and the subtrace and the same alignment that's also an alignment for this bigger tree for A, B. So at this point, we don't have to propose anything. We just collect these three sub-alignments. And now from this five sub-alignments, we would like to compose an alignment for the trace D, C, A, B, C, D. And we do so by taking into account the initial splitting so we first take DC, then we take the, the empty sequence, the alignment of the empty sequence, then we take AB, again the alignment of the empty sequence, and then CD, SCD. And finally, we simply concatenate these two alignments and we have in the end an alignment for the whole trace and the whole process tree. So putting things together, 
first, we recursively split the trace along the tree hierarchy and assign these subtraces to subtrees. Once we stop, we calculate optimal subalignments. And from these subalignments, we recursively compose an alignment uh, for the upper parts. Now, one thing to note is that when we want to compute these splittings and assignments fast, we cannot analyze the subtrees and its whole behavior because it would be simply too time consuming. And therefore, we use a simplified view on a subtree, and this is called a gray, gray box view, which I'm going to explain now. So if we reconsider the rock running example that we have seen before, we compute for each subtree, so here we have T1 and T2, four characteristics. So we compute this set of activities, this set of start activities, this set of end activities, and if the empty trace exists, is accepted. So we call it the tau flag. And if we uh, take a look at T1, for example, we see A, B, C, D occurs in the subtree. All traces start with A, C, or D. They end with B, C, or D, and the empty trace is not accepted by T1. And all of these four characteristics, they can be very easily calculated. That means there's a low computation effort to, to get these characteristics. And on this slide, you see, for example, the recursive definition of calculating the start activities. So if the process tree just consists of a leaf node, then the start activity is just an A. If it's a tau, then we have the empty sequence. If we have a sequence as a root operator and the empty trace is not accepted by T1, then it's simply the start activities of T1. Otherwise, we take the union. For choice and parallelism, it is always the union because we can execute the subtrees in any order and for parallelism also in an interleaved manner. And for the loop, it's actually the same as for the sequence. So now the question is, how does our approach assume the behavior of a subtree just based on these four characteristics that we have? So only these four characteristics are available to our approach. And now the question is, how do we interpret these characteristics? And our approach assumes that the subtree behaves like the following. So it accepts traces that start with the start activity followed by an arbitrary number of activities, and it ends with an end activity. Moreover, if the tau flag is true, we also assume that the empty sequence is accepted, and if the intersection of start and end activities is the empty set, uh, it's not the empty set, then we also accept traces of length one that have an activity right from this intersection. And we call this in the paper the most liberal interpretation, according to these four characteristics, or you can also think of this as a restricted flower model that takes these characteristics into account. So if we return now to our running example and we take a look at the left subtree, here you see the interpretation of the left subtree. So this is how the approach considers the behavior of a subtree based on these four characteristics. And what you see is that this interpretation allows for much more behavior than the original subtree. So for example, C, A, B, C, D, A, D, these are all traces that are accepted by the interpretation, but not in this uh, original subtree. And this is kind of the source why our um, approximation algorithm is actually approximating, because this interpretation is more liberal than the actual subtree. What we also see is that all traces from the original subtree, they are in the interpretation, but not the other way around, as we have seen here in this red box. So now, given this interpretation, so our gray box view on subtrees, how does the splitting actually work? And we start with the choice operator, because that's the most simple operator. And the choice operator, according to the semantics, means that we either execute T1 or we execute T2. That means we either assign the trace to T1 or T2. And we do so by calculating the lowest added distance. So we calculate the added distance from this trace to the closest trace in the interpretation of T1, and the added distance of this trace and the closest trace in the interpretation of T2, and then the lowest added distance wins. So an example, assume we assign the trace to T1. Eventually then we get an alignment so we get an alignment for trace A1 to AN and T1, and this alignment is also an alignment for the whole sub, uh, for the whole tree. So also the composing part is quite easy. So sequence, according to the semantics of the sequence, we first have to execute T1, and then we execute T2. 
That means we have to assign a subtrace to each subtree. This results in n plus one possible splitting options or positions where we can actually split our trace. And in this example, just assume that we split somewhere in the middle. That means we assign A1 to AI to the left subtree and AI plus one to AN to the right subtree. Then eventually we contain uh, alignments for the subtraces and subtrees. And then we simply concatenate them together to obtain alignment for the whole tree. Now parallelism is the most complex, uh, complex tree operator. So parallelism means we can execute the two subtrees in any order and also in an interleaved manner. And this means that we can actually assign every activity to either of the two uh, subtrees. So we assign in this case A1 and A3 to T2 and A2 and A4 to T1. That means we generate these two subtraces and eventually, again, we get an alignment for those. And if we now want to compose an alignment for the whole tree from these two sub-alignments, we have to take into account the initial assignment. So first of all, we see that we assign A1 to T2. So we take this part from the sub-alignment that explains AI. Then we move over to the other sub-alignment. We take the part that explains A2 and so on. In the end, we obtain. And last, we have the loop operator. So according to the semantics, we first have to execute T1. Afterwards, we can execute T2. And if we do so, we afterwards have again to execute T1. That means that we need an odd number of subtraces to be generated. And the first trace is a subtrace is assigned to T1, the second one to T2, the third one to T1, and so on and so forth. And in this example, assume we split twice at this highlighted position. That means we assign A1, A2 to T1, the empty sequence to T2, and A3, A4 to T1. And then finally, or eventually, we get alignments for these uh, subtraces and subtrees. And then it is similar to the sequence, we just concatenate them together by taking a look at this initial splitting. Now, putting things together regarding the splitting and assigning, like every time we split and we assign, we are concentrating on the interpretation of a subtree, which is again uh, based on these four characteristics that I've shown you. And we always try to minimize the total edit distance between the subtraces that we generate and the corresponding closest trace in the language of the interpretation of the assigned subtree. And this splitting and assigning can be defined as an integer linear program. And on the right hand side, you see such a program for finding splittings and assignments for the sequence operator. However, given the limited time of this presentation, uh, we cannot go into details at this point. So on this slide, you see some results of the conducted experimental evaluation. So the first plots are for the BPI challenge log 2019 where we have an average trace length of 28 and the process tree height that we used has a height of uh, 24. So how to read this heat map? You see here the average alignment cost and you see here the tree height on the y-axis. For example, five means that during the recursive splitting and assigning, if we reach a sub, uh, sub tree that has, that has height five or lower, then we stop the splitting and return an optimal alignment. The same for the trace lengths. So if we doing the splitting and assignment get a subtrace sub of length five or lower, then we also stop. So that means that this combination five five results in the maximum splitting along the tree hierarchy. And uh, here in this uh, setting where we have 2020, we just uh, split only a few times. And what you see is that the more we split, so the deeper we go into the hierarchy, the worst get the results. So the optimal alignment is on average 23.41. And if we split only a few times, we are at 24.1. And if we split a lot, then we are at 24.74. Uh, now, if we compare this now to the computation time, we see if we split a lot, like in this 5.5 setting, we only need roughly two seconds. And this is approximately 125 times faster in comparison to computing an optimal alignment, which takes an average 300 seconds. And even if we only split a few times, we still are three times faster, actually, than the optimal alignment. So you see there's a clear trade-off between computation time and quality. 
So coming to the conclusion, what we have seen is an approach for alignment approximation specifically for process trees. So we really utilize the tree hierarchy. Um, it consists mainly of three steps. So first, we recursively split the trace into subtraces and assign these subtraces to uh, subtrees. And this is based on this gray box view that I've shown you. In the second step, we compute optimal sub-alignments. And from these optimal sub-alignments, we recursively compose an alignment for the root nodes. And in the end, this is also quite important to note, is that we always return a valid alignment according to the definition of an alignment. But this alignment does not need to be necessarily optimal, but it is always valid. And besides the specific implementation, we also define a general framework that describes in a formal way this splitting and assigning and composing. And this allows, for example, other people, if they have other strategies, uh, so also other strategies are, are welcome and uh, thinkable. So that's not the only idea that could be plugged in into this formal framework. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. I thank you from the behalf of the whole audience. Um, questions. So if you have questions, raise your hand or type them in a the chat window. While you're raising your hand or type in a chat window, maybe I can ask a question. Can you quickly comment on the computational complexity of this approach? Like, is it computationally complex or can it run fast? I couldn't hear you complex like the complexity of the of the runtime. Yes, yes, yes. Algorithmic complexity of, of the algorithm. Yeah. So of course, in the end, we still have to calculate optimal alignments, right? So as I told you, we split along the tree hierarchy, and in the end, we still have to solve a normal kind of normal alignment problem. However, since we divide this into sub-problems, we can be much faster because the state spaces that we need to explore, they are much smaller. And also all these sub-problems, they're independently. That means we can also um, solve them in parallel. So this is why we have a lower uh, complexity. And uh, in return, we also have to calculate, as I said, we have to solve these ILPs that give us the, the actual splitting and assignment. However, as we have seen in our experimental evaluation, the computation time is kind of neglectable uh, to solve this other piece to get this best splittings and assignments. All right, thank you. I see a question from Sander. Sander, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question, that would be great. Yeah, Sander. Hello? There, is, there is a question in the chat, uh, our team. Mm, yes. But Sander, you are unmuted now. If you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Maybe there is a problem with the microphone uh, authorization yeah. in the browser. Maybe you can, uh, it's better that you, you write down in the chat the question while you go to another question. Yeah, yeah. type your question, Sander, in the chat, and I'll ask a question from Amin. Uh, I, I mean, ask a question. I just not quite understood why loop is binary and not unary in the tree. Why loop is binary? I guess why there are two branches in the loop. Uh, I mean, no, actually, you just... so a semantics there's actually no difference if you have three subtrees or only two. You can just define it in a different way. Then you will have a sequence, and then in the end, a, a choice between the exit path actually. So if you have a binary tree or a tree with n subchildren, it's not a, it doesn't make a difference here. Does that answer the question, Ami? Uh, somehow, because I was not wondering, uh, because when we say something happens, for example, n times, so we're yeah. referring to some part of the process, so one block. So why the loop has two branch? That was I'm not quite following. Okay, so maybe we go back to the loop and just explain again how this works. So the loop, let me close it here. So the loop has actually a do part. So we always have to execute at least once this do part, and then we have a redo part. So if we first execute the do part once, then we can decide either we stop completely the execution or we again execute the redo part, and then afterwards we have to again execute the do part. Uh, so the loop is defined based on two subcomponents. 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Thanks. in the whole paper, also we restrict the binary trees because that makes the splitting a bit easier. Mm -hmm. But the binary process tree can be easily converted also into a normal process tree that has n subchildren. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nice presentation as well. Thank you. So maybe quickly from Sander, he types in the chat that sometimes alignment uh, have difference in fitness of up to zero point two. I know twenty percent or something probablement. What does it twenty percent from the optimal value? What does it measure look like for your approach? Are we actually so how far how far are you from the correct result? So you can see it actually here. We never we, so we didn't compare based on fitness. So we compared actually on alignment costs based on the standard uh, standard um, cost function. So I cannot calculate it right in the head what this is the fitness value, but we see we are cl quite close actually to the original uh, optimal mm. alignment cost. So what would this look like for um, the, for other types of real life logs? What do you mean? Like, uh, I mean, uh, if you would run it for different types of, uh, of, of models by uh, different miners and different, uh, different real life logs. Yes. I mean, you, you've so, tested these two, which is fine, but what, what would it do on, let's say, more examples? Do you, could you give some insights? Yeah, so on this, this two logs, we use actually inductive miner and frequent version to get a process tree. We also did some synthetic experiments where we synthetically generated process trees. And there also, we also incorporated duplicate labels. So we did two kinds of sets, first synthetic data sets, process trees that don't have duplicate labels and ones with duplicate labels. And of course, if you have also duplicate labels, the problem gets a bit more involved actually in the splitting and assignment because you see actually activity in both interpretations then in the end. But still, we have seen quite good results for that, also comparable to the ones I'm showing you here. All right, let's trust uh, and leave the speaker. Let's move it offline discussion. The results indeed look very promising. Uh, let's uh, switch to the paper by Adam Burke, Sander Lemons, and Mo Wynn. And the title of the paper is Stochastic Process Discovery by Weight Estimation. Thank you once again, Daniel. It was a nice presentation. Thank you. Yes, we can see the slides, Adam. So the floor is yours. We cannot hear you. You're probably muted. Yeah, unmute. Yeah, no. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Adam. Um, so, uh, this is the team that worked on the research. Um, why don't we uh, dive straight in? To... So, I'm going to start with a problem uh, use case type idea. So, if we think about a problem like um, what how uh, for a commuter, how are you choosing to get to work in the morning? What, what, what form of transport are you choosing? And we have here a very simplified fragment of, of one part of a process like that, choosing between uh, two types of forms of transport uh, for getting to work. So we've got a train, we've got a bicycle. All right, well, this is kind of capturing something quite important about the process. These are the choices. This is a classic control flow model petri net fragment. Um, and if we add a bit of information to that, um, that's a very important uh, aspect of this process, I would argue, in that um, if we add some weights to this to make this a stochastic fragment of a model, we get a lot more information that we're much, much more likely to take the train if we're a commuter in this particular path. So this so if we think about this, well, what, this is something an analyst could investigate. Why would this be happening? Okay, well, maybe the trains are just much better and more reliable than uh, the cycling infrastructure that it's available uh, in this particular uh, city, in this particular path. Uh, and that's information that 
a organization like a city council or a train company can use when investing, choosing where to fix. And then we think about comparing that to another process, um, then we also get a situation where, okay, that's a pretty radically different process. If it's we're much more versus a process where we're much more likely to use the, the bicycle, maybe the train is in a very terrible condition in that case. So that's the starting point uh, for this whole program of research, essentially that the stochastic view or stochastic aspects of process models are very important and, and distinguish uh, processes radically, which are not shown in the basic control flow view. Um, so given that, given that this is an important viewpoint when distinguishing and understanding processes, uh, we're looking at stochastic process discovery. So how do we discover these process models automatically um, using the sort of techniques that um, we're, we're familiar with for control flow discovery? And the approach that we've taken um, in this particular research we're talking about is to build on the existing successes of control flow discovery algorithms um, and then transform that into something which is a stochastic process model with informed by both the control flow model and the log. And here the control flow model is in the form of a petri net and we go through an estimation process we output a generalized stochastic petri net which is what gspn stands for this is a well-established mathematical formalisms formalism for representing uh, processes with where there's an aspect of probability is very important it's a key aspect of it they use they have various applications from uh, biology to operations research so this estimate aspect on the right of this diagram we've they we've come up with uh, various approaches for doing estimation we're, it, with the understanding that this is actually a pretty broad space, just as there's many control flow discovery algorithms, we think potentially there's many uh, estimation algorithms or st stochastic process discovery algorithms. Um, and here's an example. So here are two inputs. We've had an example log and uh, example uh, output model from a control flow discovery process. And then if we look at one of the estimators that we used, so this is a very straightforward estimator where we simply lift the activity frequencies into the process model. And then we do a defaulting around the silent transition uh, in the middle. And this is called a frequency estimator. And it's the most straightforward of the ones that we're looking at. Um, we propose some other estimators, a more complicated example. We have something we call a fork distributed estimator. Um, in this process, it uses the activity pair frequencies from the log. It does a multi-step process. First, it associates the activity pair frequencies with a place in the Petri net, and then it transforms or distributes those weights to the transitions. And in a general stochastic Petri net, weights are on transitions, they're not on places. Um, so, it, and it does that according, in, again, informed by frequencies of things that it finds in the log. Um, the, what, there's a relationship here with the alpha algorithm in that the alpha algorithm also really identifies neighborhoods based on the directly follows or activity pair basis and then goes from there uh, and deduces a control flow. Well, like the basic idea here is that these control flow algorithms um, are also, also have a lot of information about uh, causality uh, in, and that we can leverage that 
in make and make inferences about uh, a stochastic process representation as a result. So uh, in this research, there's six estimators uh, that we developed within this particular framework. There, there could certainly be more. This is not a complete list, but these are the six that we discussed in the accompanying paper. They go from the very straightforward uh, frequency estimator that we walked through, the fork distributed. There's a couple of other ones that leverage activity pairs. Um, the, one of them represents, um, it is scaled because we found that uh, it's quite difficult to compare stochastic process models when there's not a common point of scaling, at least for human comparison. Um, and then uh, there's one that leverages alignments, this very well established process mining tool, which we heard about in the previous paper as well. Um, for evaluation, uh, so we ex evaluated these experimentally. Uh, we used uh, six uh, publicly available real world logs. We used three um, established uh, control flow discovery algorithms. It's a fairly straightforward evaluation. Uh, we were able to leverage something that's quite new in the space, which is uh, stochastic uh, process conformance measures. Uh, there's uh, earth movers and entropy recall and precision measures that we're able to leverage in evaluating as well as things like runtime. We're also comparing to an existing technique named here the Rog Salty discovery technique, uh, which is notable because there's not a lot of stochastic process mining existing discovery techniques, and this is the only one with the publicly available uh, implementation. So when we were evaluating, we were looking at, okay, we've got six different estimators but is there really any difference between them is there any difference between these estimators and the existing technique um, how fast are they and how applicable are they when we look at, across different types of logs um, so we did see a difference um, we saw uh, there was clear differences when we combined different control flow algorithms and the different estimators uh, with using a stochastic measure, this is the earth movers measure with 0.8 um, probability mass. Uh, in this particular example, the 2018 control log, uh, we have uh, the RSD or ROG SALTY discovery technique um, is actually higher quality, but uh, the, the estimators under this framework are pretty comparable. Um, sometimes we actually see they're better quality. Um, versus the existing technique using, this is in this case, the entropy measures, uh, where we're able to uh, find a meaningful stochastic process uh, where the existing technique does not. Um, they're generally faster. There's a few, uh, that, that's pretty expected because they're more computationally tractable. Um, they're mostly linear in the log and the model, apart from the alignments. But the, uh, there's a little bit of noise here on the smaller logs and there's some things where for fast uh, runs and small logs, for instance, the split miner was invoked out of process um, where, where this adds a startup time. Um, I would note that this is a log scale. Um, so it, the black line is the RSD technique, the existing technique, which is a very great deal um, slower. On, on a number of these more complex logs um, and there's actual timeouts in, in, that are excluded from this graph for RSD. Uh, so on the more difficult logs where RSD returned no result, we were able to get a stochastic process result uh, model out of it, which was pretty, fairly meaningful on the measures. Uh, so in summary, uh, this is an opportunity to make discovering stochastic process models cheaper, it builds on existing control flow discovery techniques. It, it's not a replacement, but it provides alternative tools in the toolkit. Uh, it got shorter run times, it's more tolerant of event log variation, some trade off against quality, but comparable quality in some cases where it's better. It's a large problem space, we look forward to improve estimators, other direct stochastic discovery algorithms, and uh, some it would be an interesting follow-up to have 
a stochastic aware simplicity conformance measure. Uh, there's a publicly available implementation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Adam. Again, I thank you on behalf of all the attendees. Okay, there are others here also unmuted. Uh, questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand or type in a chat window. Claudio has a question. Yes, please. Uh, I was clapping. Are you clapping? No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. So there is <laughs> clapping longer there. Okay, raise your hand it's if, very, you, very if nice you have a question. Um, so maybe, Adam, can you quickly again summarize? Out of all these uh, approximation techniques, uh, also right, uh, or, or annotation techniques that you propose, what will, which one will you recommend? Right? So out of these six ones, which one? Yeah, which one so this is a, a good question. Um, I think to pick a default, the pair scale is a good default. Uh, where, because the rock salty technique also leverages alignment, so if there's no result because of alignments, then the alignment-based estimator can perform better, but it could also take a very long time on a large log. Um, the pair scale, it's easier to compare, uh, uh, do a human comparison. But uh, based on the evaluation, there's no very clear one winner, um, which is why it was more important to, to share the space. Um, in this particular case. Yeah, thank you. Will has a question. Will, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, so thanks a lot for the presentation. It's also interesting, uh, let's say, that you're using the earth mover distance uh, here for the evaluation. Um, like, uh, my main question would be, uh, but you were very brief on the actual metrics that you are computing. But it seems that you only consider probabilities and not times. And if you have concurrent constructs, then there is a race between things that are running concurrently, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so would there be ways of extending, uh, first, am I correct? And then if so, would there be ways of extending this to also uh, somehow take into account the temporal dimension? You also mentioned that Andreas Rogazolti was the only person having something like that. But of course, in the past, there have been quite a number of papers and approaches and implementations to generate simulation models that focus more on this timing aspect rather than the probability aspect. Uh, yeah, sure. So. Um... I, I'm not sure exactly how I phrased it, but in terms of the existing work, um, yeah, there are there is other work, uh, but uh, the Rog Salt, Andreas Rogsalti work was the only one that combined that with the publicly available implementation, which is particularly useful in our evaluation. At least, uh, maybe I've missed some existing work, in which case I, the uh, the uh, pointers would be welcome. Um, Hello. I'd like to, to, to follow up on that. Of course, the first person to really generate simulation models based on uh, event logs was Anna Rosinat, and okay. that was implemented in PROM. But of course, this is an older version of PROM, and I can see the, the difficulties that one has today to reproduce work that is 15 years old. Well, I, like that. I can see that. Uh, but sometimes things get forgotten again, right? That, uh, uh, that's, that's definitely a risk. Uh, that'll be a good one to follow up on. The, the other question that I caught was about um, the time perspective. Uh, it's true, you're completely correct. This particular work is purely focused on uh, models which are using immediate transitions and don't have the time perspective in what it's generating. And I, that would be uh, a good way to extend it or another direction that it goes into. Uh, it's true that in that sense, it also specializes, for instance, the Roxalti work, which does uh, include the time perspective and includes more di more general uh, distributions and, and things of that nature. Yeah, so, so, so for me to understand, uh, suppose that I have a parallel branch and in this one parallel branch, I have a path that always takes exactly one week, right? And then I have a, another concurrent branch where the times are more stochastic. 
it seems that then you are splitting behavior uh, the way that you do your computations, this would be relatively difficult to to capture, right? Uh, yeah. So, so knowing that something is delayed, is... you know that something later will also be delayed or something like that? that yeah. yeah, so it's not going to capture that directly or be directly sensitive to that time perspective. I, I think that's right. And that would be a good a extreme test for of a particular edge for these um, estimators. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have time for one quick question. If anyone has a quick question, um, maybe I'll ask a question. So you do this um, two-stage approach, right? Where you first discover a model and then you annotate it with, like you do another go and you annotate it with probabilities. Uh, do you think potential in a technique which will kind of do it in a one go? So, so you know that the discovery techniques, they account for frequencies, they use frequencies internally. Wouldn't it be more kind of interesting or interesting to try to bring those frequencies that are managed within the algorithms to the surface and depict them in the model? So, so uh, yeah, I agree that that's also an interesting uh, line of investigation. And I think it's entirely possible that you could get uh, kind of like a direct stochastic process discovery algorithm, which outputs a stochastic process model. And as a side effect, you get a control flow model. Um, and and so, so I agree. Um, and because somehow you're then the constrained, you're already constrained by the structure, right? The structure is given by the discovery, and then you try to fit the probabilities within that structure, which is partly limiting. Uh, it is a constraint uh, as well, I, I agree. Um, and um, I, I think there is definitely stuff to explore there. One of the things uh, this work started more based on direct discovery or on stochastic process mining sort of versions of uh, existing algorithms. And uh, we found that it decomposed very rapidly into intermediate sort of data structures which looked like models. And so that's why we took this line. But I think that original line of going directly from log to something like a GSPN is still very much a line that could be pursued and there's there's things there. All right. Thank you, Adam. Once again, thank you. Thanks a lot for the questions, uh, Adam and Will and everyone. Okay, I'll pass the word to Claudio who will introduce the third speaker. With pleasure. Thank you, Artem. Uh, so I would introduce now Amin Shalali. Uh, I hope. Um, so with his paper graph-based process mining. I mean, I think I wouldn't like to uh, steal any further time from your presentation, looking forward to it. So the stage is yours. Could you please share your screen? Thank you, Claudio. Can you see my screen? Perfectly, thanks. Um, let me just minimize this. Yes, thank you everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Amin Jalali, and I'm going to present this work, which is about graph-based process mining. So I think all of us love business processes and what exists around business processes are people who are collaborating with, uh, with each other in connected work and uh, also the data is connected. So as we can see, business processes deals with a lot of data and a lot of environment that is highly connected. And uh, this is true for business process management and also for data analytics. In data analytics, what we can see that we project a view from the real world, from connected data, and we put it into structures, either it is CSV files, tables, or any other structures. Then we do analysis and we see, okay, it's not f uh, fully what we want, and then come back and we iterate until we get some aspects of what we want from business processes. So this approach makes the analysis very time consuming and also maybe not very good for some applications. For example, I, I work in the industry that I saw application of fraud detection and here the use of graph database really shines because we try to capture data 
in the closest form to its reality. So we try to have data as nodes and we shall connect it to each other. And this connected environment can be represented in graph database in a better way that reduce these cycles of uh, projecting data into a structured form and then do analysis and come back again. Also, I did some experiment uh, in a project in healthcare, uh, which was about uh, drug interaction systems, which shows the use of this graph data is very interesting and very beneficial in the connected data when we deal with such a complexity. In general, uh, what I found is that it, there are many advantages with graph database, like uh, complex graph processing, when we need to do a lot of complex uh, processing on data, which are based on graph. And uh, it's a scale very well, because uh, you can scale both vertically and horizontally, uh, meaning that you can uh, increase the power of the computer itself, or you can duplicate uh, servers to, or uh, even increase uh, the number of servers to boost your performance. Uh, they are very good in pattern-based analysis. If you have some patterns, for example, here, you want to know if the person did fraud or not, and you have some patterns in mind, they are very good in finding those patterns. And it's very good in data management. Recently, for example, Neo4j added advanced data management strategy that helps preserving privacy there. Also, it's very good in, perform, uh, in performance in terms of case-based analysis. For example, in this area for fraud detection, imagine that mostly you are investigating a case and you have all the data connected to that case and you can do this case-based analysis a very fast way. So let's come back to our process mining and see how uh, currently we work nowadays. So we uh, take a, a snapshot of the real world and put it into like files. It can be also databases. So it, in minimum, we have case ID, which represent what case was it and activity names and many other informations like who has performed that and so on. Then we do some uh, uh, analysis on that to see what relation exists between different elements in this like file. For example, here I show directly follow graph, a DFG, which is, uh, for example, how many times activity A is followed by activity B, we come with the matrix. And here we should uh, analyze the whole like files. And finally, we have a presentation in terms of process models. So one may say, okay, we try to feed as much as possible data and then maybe come with a very good process model to decrease the number of iterations that we need to gather more data. Uh, well, this is known as a, a spaghetti problem that uh, you can feed the process mining algorithm with a lot of data, but probably you do not get much benefits from that. So in reality, not only we should limit the number of data and perspective that we are feeding to this process, but also we need to slice and dice the information and data to get relevant aspects of the part of process models. And at least from my experience, we spent more time from left to right. So the time that we spent on business processes to understand the context, to understand what is connected to each other is much more than the time that we spent on cleaning and creating like files. The same true for cleaning and uh, creating like files, the time usually makes more time than for example, discovering DFG or other sort of uh, process uh, uh, analysis. And the same applies for uh, representing the uh, graph uh, in compared to calculating this DFG. So this is uh, very time consuming and what graph database to my belief can help is this area to shorten the cycles that uh, we try to select some part of data and do some calculations. Of course, I do not believe that it can do all calculations about process mining. For example, we have a lot of alignment and other uh, useful uh, process mining algorithm, but it can actually uh, get responsible for some of the computation as I can show you in the next slide. So the idea is that to hopefully generate this data uh, or save this data in graph database, which is highly connected. But here I show you how the like files also can be converted to this uh, graph database. Let's call it graph event repository. So at top, we have uh, some like files, so uh, which can be specified as one business process. 
or here the whole like file. And then each like file has several traces, which is the case for business process. For example, a student has a case when we run the course. And for each case or trace, there are many events that happens. And the events are happened in some orders. So the events are a critical part because they have uh, they can be related to many information. For example, the basic information that we are all interested in discovering control flow is the activity uh, that happened for that event. So we can represent which activity was that event was related to. And here is the interesting part about a uh, graph database because as I said, it's very good for pattern-based analysis. So we can say for two activity, for example, A2 and A3, how many times they, there was a relation between that. For that, you need to go one level up to their events that coming from and see how many times those relations fulfill. So these sort of queries are very simple in graph database because like relational database that has query language, graph database has a query language called Cypher, which uh, implemented in some uh, graph database, including No4j. So what it does, it says uh, for each two uh, attribute, activity one and activity two is, uh, uh, is two sort of attributes, uh, get the events and uh, corresponding events. And if those events are directly connected to each other, just count them and uh, returns uh, the result. So the result is a sort of matrix, which is uh, usually we come uh, prehend as DFG matrix. So uh, this is very handy and easy to compute in graph databases. Of course, other informations can be uh, specified in attributes, like for example, process itself has some attributes, trace has some attributes, and also events. It's not, not only activity names, but also for example, who has done the job or other informations. And the interesting part is that uh, it's not only computation of, for example, process mining algorithm that is important. For example, if you know who has done this activity and the other one, in graph database, you can have the connection between these people as how they work in reality or what different teams they belong to. The same applies for different information. So this is the part that uh, represent the event repository, but from attribute sites, you can connect them through different semantics that they follow in the context of business process. So I try to evaluate the performance as well and see how does it uh, work uh, uh, in reality. But for that, we implemented it uh, in No4j. And this is how the implementation looks like. As I saw first uh, note, we have like. So it's like XES standard that we have like and like has some traces. Here, the like has traces and trace has events. And of course, all of them has attributes and attributes has key uh, and value. So you can see, for example, uh, the attributes that this event is related, it's case uh, concept name, which is activity name. And uh, this one is log concept name, which is the log name. And any sort of attributes can be defined in this way. So we can actually mimic the standard that is used for uh, event logs in process mining, also for graph database uh, to drive uh, the structure and uh, define algorithm based on that. So how I evaluated uh, the performance is that uh, I set up the environment first. So I provided the event like, uh, and also the, uh, created this event repository in graph database. Then I wanted to uh, this, uh, evaluate based on two experiments. The first experiment, uh, I made the number of events as constant and I take CPU and RAM as variable. Uh, uh, in that sense. So the CPU and uh, RAM was uh, changed based on this range of numbers. For example, uh, for the RAM, I started with 500 megabyte uh, and scale it to four gigabyte. And in experiment two, I make CPU and RAM constant and make the events as variable. And for that, I selected events based on different days. I started from one day and in a cumulative way, I added the number of days to get more events. So in this way, I make a, I combined, I compiled a list of experience and uh, through this sub process, I selected one experiments from the list and then set up the environment, meaning that I parameterized the uh, input to the container that run based on these parameters and uh, ran it through the Docker. 
So the use of Docker is very good because we can uh, control how much CPU, RAM, and other resources can be assigned to one container to measure the performance, how it performs. And the result is uh, saved into experiment result. So I continue this until all experimentals are done uh, and then uh, compare the result finally. So this is the first result that uh, the number of events was constant and the, num uh, and the uh, CPU and RAM was variable. So it's interesting because as you can see, when uh, it's no surprise when we couldn't fit the event logs into the memory, for example, a, a traditional approach like process mining for Python cannot compute that because it needs to load the log into the uh, RAM and if the uh, RAM is not good, is not big enough for uh, the log files, it cannot compute the uh, DFG. But the interesting point was Neo4j uh, is that even the log is much less than uh, the number of RAM that we have, it still can compute. And note that uh, we uh, use that for the same computer. So we, we try to fair and did not increase the number of computer then run the query. So. One point is that the uh, Neo4j never uh, get better result from process mining for Python, which sounds right because in memory computation is usually fast. So uh, with the use of database and other things, you are actually adding more metadata that probably it's not expected that you can uh, exceed the in memory computation. But in experience too, it was something interesting because I took the CPU and RAM constant and the number of events as variable. So here, what surprise happens is that uh, did, despite we didn't scale, uh, Neo4j was uh, performed better. And the reason might be, might be because of that, that uh, it uh, stores the uh, nodes which are closer to each other in physically. So when we uh, slice and dice the information uh, in a small scale, it performs much better than process mining for Python. And with a small scale, we are speaking about 2 million rows of events. So I try to finish it soon. So uh, um, Thank you. The, main, the main part of uh, the future work can be how we can relate this business process data and an event repository that we can get the best of graph database. Also interesting in terms of preserving uh, privacy and uh, I started developing one library uh, for Python to combine process mining and graph databases. Thank you. Thank you very much, I mean, for your presentation. So, um, questions from the audience. So you can uh, both write in the chat or, the chat or raise your hand. Um, if not, um, well, while you elaborate more on this, uh, on, on your curiosities, well, I would rather uh, give it a start. So um, one thing that I was wondering is uh, whether during your experiments, you also tried using Cypher, not only as a way to return a DF, um, so that directly follow, follows graphs, but also as a filter, like finding all the events that share the same resource, for instance, and what was the outcome? Uh, yes, uh, in this, uh, the, in the second experiment, actually the filter was done based on the date because we started uh, taking, uh, selecting based on one day and add more days to get more number of events. And this was interesting that when we uh, say we dice and uh, slice in a small scale, it uh, really, the performance is better than uh, other techniques. So that's uh, what I think it's, uh, it has one benefit and one strong point in, in using uh, graph database, not only to get uh, uh, good uh, the DFG, but also to get faster when we uh, select some part of that. Very nice, and, very nice. And I, if there is time, I can say that, for example, uh, here is very uh, easy way you can get the DFG from graph database with just few line of code and you can combine it, for example, with process mining for Python to visualize that. It's not something that either you use that or this one. So you combine that. And other, for example, you can write custom uh, Cypher query language so you can combine it with more complex analysis. You can, for example, I had one project for drug interactions. You can get, uh, go to the semantic of drugs and see how does uh, they connect to each other. And so this really uh, gives many flexibility. 
Thank you. Right. Uh, it, it, uh, great to show also this uh, snippet because this goes straight to the core of the question. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Um, questions from the audience? Because otherwise I would still keep on. I mean, it's very interesting as a project, so I have quite a number of <laughs> things yeah. to ask. All right. So then, uh, in the meantime, I would ask, um, you mentioned privacy in the conclusion. So mm -hmm. could you please elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, yes, in the, uh, actually in the original paper that I uh, uh, write the draft, I elaborate on that more, but not in this paper because it was 12 pages. Uh, in Neo4j4, they added some new sort of uh, uh, privacy, which is very interesting, or I can say security checking. You can say, I have Claudio as analyst in my, uh, for example, company. I want him to, uh, for example, for event, cannot see the name of customer but you can traverse the customer without seeing the detail. So actually you can run some sort of process mining without violating the privacy. So I do not expose some information in the log to some analyst, but enable an analyst to run the query and solve the relations. And this is very flexible. Unfortunately, this is available on enterprise, which is not free in you know, Node4j. It's a shame, but uh, it's available. And uh, this is very interesting add for new Neo4j that is added, for example. One other thing that I can show you, this is I, one trace that I provided the same, why it computes well between two pairs, this is two activities, and how it calculate is that there are many events for this one, many events for this one, and then it just go to pattern recognition. It doesn't show all of the events in this view because it doesn't show more than 250 something. But in this way, the computation behind the scene actually is different. So it's based mm -hmm. on node base and that's increased the performance. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very I much. Yes. Please, go ahead. I, I, I have a quick question, sorry. Uh, can you ex ex uh, explain quickly like how you combine the process mining library with the Neo4j? Like, uh, uh, did, mm -hmm. did, you, like um, did you use like a batch injection or was it in the streaming? Uh, actually, I developed a new library called Neo4pm that I released two days ago, I think. So you're welcome to use that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Really cutting edge research here. <laughs> okay, great. So, well, I see that um, I, uh, maybe if there are more questions, we could take advantage of a virtual coffee time. It is following now. Uh, for the sake of time, unfortunately, I have to uh, close the, um, this presentation now. But thanks a lot for uh, the very interesting uh, research um, projects you have shown us and all of the, uh, the, for all the whole workshop, of course. Um, right, so maybe, Artem, would you like to uh, say some concluding remarks and words about the workshop? Well, I just would like to and say thank you everyone for attending, for participating. Thank you, speakers. Uh, it's the start of ICPM conference, many talks, exciting talks ahead of us. Uh, so enjoy the conference and see you next year at the PQMI workshop. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.